this was a CT that was done at six hours of stroke onset. And you can definitely see there is something wrong that's going on in the AC and MCA territory region. And uh, clearly, if you want to see the insular cortex on the left side, it's very nice and normal. The sulci are good and there is a good gray white differentiation. But on the right side, on the other hand, I'm not able to really tell the gray white differentiation. And there is a little bit of sulcal effacement also. And in the frontal area and even in a little bit of parietal area also, and I'm able to see hypodensity. That's very obvious. This is a six hour CT. And by 12 hours mark, the hypodensity becomes very, very obvious. And I don't think anyone can miss this anymore. But the patient is not having any mass effect as of now. There is no midline shift. This is a CT that was taken at 24 hours. Where it has transformed into a space occupying cerebral edema. It is no longer a simple cerebral edema. It is a space occupying cerebral edema. And it's a malignant cerebral edema which is causing a lot of mass effect in the form of midline shift which is more than 5 millimeter in this case and at the same time there is a definite uncle herniation that is compressing on the midbrain also and this patient should definitely be taken for hemicarectomy even though the prognosis and the final neurological outcome is not going to be that great but at least to save this patient you need to go for medical and decompressive craniectomy and this is another example of cerebral edema appearing in the imaging and as you can see here this patient is having a definite hypodensity it's a huge hypodensity in the left MCA territory region and the arrows are going to tell the borders of the stroke and this is the corresponding diffusion weighted imaging telling you how big the stroke is in the MCA territory region and even in the early stages you can see a bit of mass effect in the form of ipsilateral ventricular compression even though there is no significant midline shift happening and this is the ct that was taken next day after hemicranectomy because this patient was taken for uh, decomposing hemicranectomy with the idea that this patient will definitely develop herniation and what you can see is even after hemicranectomy there is a significant mass effect producing a bit of midline shift and there is a outward moment of the edematous tissue and that's why we do hemicranectomy in the first place just to uh, relax the brain tissue that is edematous and it can expand outside rather than inside so that's why we do your uh, decompressive hemicranectomy and what is the definition of malignant infarction it is defined as a large hemispherical infarction affecting the total or subtotal territory of the middle cerebral artery. Plus, it should involve the basal ganglia either partially or totally. Plus or minus, it can involve adjacent territories like anterior cerebral artery or posterior cerebral artery territory also. And what are the clinical predictors of malignant infarction or malignant cerebral edema? First one, usually patients who are about to get malignant cerebral edema are definitely uh, going to have severe neurological deficits and the presentation NHS score is going to be very high usually. Apart from that, presence of forced gaze deviation, especially in non-dominant strokes towards the right side of the gaze is deviated. That is a good predictor of development of malignant cerebral edema. Patients who are having severe visual field defects, patients who are having hemiplegia and aphasia or neglect depending on the side of the stroke, you know, Dominant lesions will produce aphasia and non-dominant lesions are going to produce neglect predominantly. And if the presentation NHS is very high, like NHS more than 15 in patients who are having right hemispherical strokes and NHS more than 20 in patients who are having left hemispheric strokes. All these are clinical predictors of development of malignant cerebral edema. And what are the radiological predictors? Patients who are having more than 50% of the MCA territory involvement, which is a very, very important point. We discussed this in the state criteria also in the previous video. And patients who are having infarct volume of more than 145 to 150 cc or 150 ml in diffusion weighted imaging, and patients who are having midline shift of more than 5 millimeter, and patients who are having multiple territorial infarcts, like patients who are having MCA and ACA territory infarcts, and patients who are having MCA and PCA territory infarcts. This MCA and PCA, in fact, typically happens in patients who are having a fetal origin of PCA. So what do you mean by fetal origin of PCA? 
this is the example of fetal origin of PCA where P1 PCA will be hypoplastic but the posterior comminuting artery will be more prominent and it will be the one that will be supplying blood to the P2 PCA which means here PCA is essentially a part of anterior circulation rather than posterior circulation and this is what we refer to as a fetal origin of PCA and this is the common situation where you get multiple territorial infarcts like MC and PCA together whenever there is a fetal origin of PCOM or PCA and if the aspect score is less than or equal to 7 that can also predict a big stroke and a subsequent development of malignant cerebral edema but the most important is these two only like more than 50% of MC territory fits involved and if the infarct volume is more than 145 to 150 m so these are the two important predictors that is used in the state criteria also to determine malignant MCA territory infarct and what's going to the treatment we discussed all the treatment involves standard medical treatment including head and elevation by 30 to 45 degrees then you can go for uh, hyperventilation uh, therapeutic hyperventilation maintaining PACO to the range of 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury and you can give some osmotic agents like mannitol or 3% NACL and that's fine so but remember whenever they develop a malignant cerebral edema just with medical therapy they're not going to survive it's only a transient therapy and the definitive therapy is going to be decompressive hemicranectomy and how effective is decompressive hemicranectomy is something that is highly questioned because the survival rates with decompressive hemicranectomy are definitely higher but most of the patients are going to survive with severe neurological deficit that is why you need to carefully discuss with the attenders whether to do this or not for sure Okay, so what are the complications of decompressive hemicranectomy? Number one, of course, is hydrocephalus. Number two is external brain tamponade because of the hemorrhage that happened because of the surgery itself, which can produce a sort of brain tamponade. And infections, these collections that happen can get infected and they can produce uh, severe sepsis and brain infection. They can develop seizures and most important that will be asked in exams is this paradoxical brain herniation which is also called as sinking skin flap syndrome that's called as ssfs sinking skin flap syndrome why this happens this happens because uh, as time progresses your infarct tissue will be destroyed by liquefaction necrosis and it will be replaced with fluid and in that situation your atmospheric pressure can become more than that of the intracranial pressure especially in the infarcted area and because the atmospheric pressure is more in this situation that can compress on the brain tissue and it can push the midline towards the opposite side and there will be a contralateral midline shift and there will be contralateral brain herniation also in extreme situations and this is what we call as paradoxical brain herniation which is also referred to as something called as sinking skin flap syndrome and this is a perfect example of such a case this patient in the early stages did have a huge stroke and you can clearly see the mass effect on the ipsilateral ventricle as well and in later CTs the hypodensity become very obvious and there is a huge midline shift this patient underwent a decompressive hemicranectomy because of the same and now you can clearly see that the brain tissue is expanding outward rather than inward and the midline shift is corrected almost and this is a patient with a chronic old stroke where most of the areas of infarcted tissue have been destroyed and now it is replaced with fluid that is equal to that of the CSF density which is what we refer to as cystic encephalomalacia and because of the loss of the brain tissue by liquefaction necrosis there is expansion of the ipsilateral ventricle and later the same patient has developed paradoxical brain herniation because of sinking skin flap syndrome as seen in this example where the atmospheric pressure in this situation is more than that of the intracranial pressure which is trying to compress the brain from outside and this is resulting in contralateral midline shift as you can see the mass effect very clearly and the midline is shifted here and this is further corrected by doing an urgent cranioplasty which again restored the midline and you can now clearly see 
the enlargement of the ventricles with cystic encephalomalacia changes. And according to most trials, your uh, paradoxical brain herniation or otherwise called a sinking skin flap syndrome typically happens by around 3 to 5 months mark after your decompressive hemicranitomy. Subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from PrepLadder.